worries, but just bear with me because this is going to be a, a double act. But basically, what we want to do. Oh, sorry. Sorry. So that I can see what you're. Do you want to be... Shall I... Um, okay, shall I... Okay, uh, okay. Is that better? Thank you. Okay, so uh, the, the workshop that um, me and Mark planned was basically firstly to just share with you very briefly the, the, the kind of really appalling practice that I'm sure some of you have been through and that we know is going on at the moment in terms of the assessments and reviews that disabled people are being forced through. Can and I say very briefly... Um, can I just finish the, the workshop, sorry, Daphne, and then, and then we'll kind of get into it. But I want to do that very quickly because... The real aim of this workshop is for you to share your experiences, to see what common things we're all facing, and then spend the last part of the workshop thinking, well, how can we, what can we do to respond? You know, how can we challenge the, 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 the treatment that, that so many of us are experiencing um, when we are assessed or reviewed? So... Um, I'm just, I mean, Ellen and Mark picked up on a lot of the issues, really, that I know in Inclusion London through our Disability Justice Project we're hearing about. But just, you know, that ranges from increasingly intrusive assessments where people are asked to, you know, act out very personal care tasks with, you know, the social worker checking to see if they really do need assistance on and off the toilet, for example. So uh, increasingly in intrusive assessments. Um, we have heard of the, um, this new phenomenon of, of putting in monitors so that social workers can check what a PA is doing, how many times they are moving in different rooms to support somebody. Um, and we know that there's a general push around um, trying to get equipment as an alternative to human um, support. We also know, and, and this is really um, escalating, um, the argument made in, in the Davy case that went to uh, um, the Crown Court recently, or the World Courts of Justice, was about absolutely twisting our definition of independent living and saying, oh, a cut in your care package is going to help you become more independent. You need to be alone, and then that will build your confidence and build your independence. So they're absolutely distorting, you know, what we fight for. We've got, so we've got to be really careful when we talk about independent living that, you know, they're, they're onto that and they're throwing it back to us, but using a completely different interpretation. So we also know that, you know, there is um, also an argument about, well, we know that somebody might uh, carry out a task and there's a risk, um, but, you know, again, uh, without support, risk is part of life and that's about independent living too. So they're justifying a lack of support by, well, you know, people um, have to take risks. You know, if you're going to fall, you're going to fall. And that's part of, you know, independent living. There's also all the kind of bureaucracy, the time it takes for the OT assessment, the other assessment, the writing of the diaries where you're having to justify every single, you know, second of your um, support package. And then we're going into really kind of clever stuff around, um, you know, how they describe needs so that they can then offer the, the very limited um, support, um, whether it's prepayment cards. Um, people aren't given, aren't, giving, aren't given documentation, so people don't know whether they're having an assessment or review. They don't know what was decided. There's, and, and obviously, this goes completely against um, the CARE Act. Um, they're even confusing reviews and, and assessments. You know, review is just to check everything is okay, and if it's not, then uh, an assessment is triggered, and that triggers a lot of rights that are being completely ignored. 
So there's a huge amount of um, increasingly appalling practice going on because local authorities are trying to manage, you know, massive cuts. Um, and it's Mark's point about, you know, ultimately, do they set an illegal budget or do they just keep on piling the cuts um, down to um, disabled people in receipt <coughs> of support? So that's just some of them. I don't know. Should we just open up the, the, the room for, you know, does that chart, um, chong, chime, that's the word, with anything that people here are experiencing yes. in terms yeah. of? Yes, yes. Should yeah, we just one person, Williams. one person at a time, the, the lady behind, then you, Daphne, then, you. so... I wonder if anybody else has experienced what happened to me when I moved forward. I was living in Hartford for Fulham after quite a the hassle I managed to get a, a decent care package of, of 30 hours a week, which met my needs perfectly, um, and I was then forced to move to Hartford for Fulham because I wasn't in the adaptive flat and I became more and I had to continue to use a wheelchair permanently. Um, having moved to Lambeth, my care package was not transferred under the three-month system, which it should have been. Mm. And I am still waiting, almost two years later, mm. to get my care package. I've just been mm. offered a derisory seven hours a week. Mm. I'd really be interested to see if anybody else has been in that same situation mm. has got any ideas. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'd like to make three points, but I will be very brief because I think lots of people are in my situation and Mark. First of all, I'll tell you my situation. When I, when the ILF closed, I had an ini initial assessment from a social worker and I had £300 a month cut off of my direct payment budget and I was really struggling. I fought and fought to get it back and the only way I could get it back was to go, I was told by the social worker that I had to have these prepaid cards and I'm not happy with that at all. Um, because I wasn't given the choice to have it or not to have it. So I'm not happy with that uh, at all. And it is, it is such a palava. So you were, there was no option. You, you were just told you're going to have yeah. the prepayment card. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, I think... The um, here yeah. and then. Can I say something about Mark Williams as well? I'm sure he won't mind me saying. He has. I don't know if you know how disabled Mark is. He's only got 10% speech and he, he needs 24 hour care. They were trying to cut his package and to each. Um, to prove that he wasn't cheating them out of any money, they had to do an hour by hour diary for two weeks. And he said it was terrible. It was very, very intrusive. And now I've shut up. <laughs> yeah. No, thanks. Mm. Um, yes, the woman here. So, um, I moved from Surrey into Lewisham um, when I graduated from university and didn't have anywhere really to go. My care package wasn't transferred, so Surrey kept paying it for 18 months, waiting for Lewisham to take over. Lewisham kept not taking over. Eventually, Surrey said, OK, well, we're not going to keep paying for this. And for about, I think it was two to three months, I was left needing the same amount of care but with nobody putting any money into paying for it. So I had to go into debt to get money to pay for my care while I was waiting for my reassessments to be done. Um, and they were eventually done. Um, 
by that point, I'd ended up in hospital many times and very, very seriously ill because my care needs weren't being met. I had paperwork saying I needed turning at least every two to four hours, um, but I couldn't be left in incontinence pads overnight because my condition affects skin integrity. Um, and all of this very much added up to me needing someone there all the time because I need to be turned so often and I have continence issues and things, um, which they still refuse to do. I insisted on a continuing healthcare assessment and they came back from that initially after six months saying that they would only meet my needs in a care home, that if I needed turning this off then it had to be a care home and basically saying I had to choose between being in a care home or not being turned enough and ending up with sores and in hospital. Thankfully that's resolved to some extent in that I've now been awarded continuing healthcare funding, but I've still not had an assessment. Um, I still keep ending up with sepsis, which is quite serious, because my needs aren't being correctly met, and I'm just waiting now for continuing healthcare. So I suspect I'm not the only person that's fallen down a gap between council-funded and continuing healthcare over who will fund what and what a care home what, how to avoid getting forced into a care home on assessment. So if anyone has anything useful about that, I'd really appreciate hearing it. Yeah. Thank you. And obviously there's a big worry now with clinical commissioning groups having caps on, on the amount of, of support they're prepared. Yes. Um, I wanted to say from new perspective, I do a lot of advocacy work for disabled <coughs> people and also parents of disabled children. It seems to have been really taking back social care. Lots of um, um, people are put at risk because they had community alarms and now they've been told they've got to pay for it. Um, I've challenged it at the co-production meeting and say that that is um, um, under the chronically sick person. I, that should be, that person said the plan, it should be put into their plan. They shouldn't be charged, but it doesn't seem to. Um, there is a way that you can get around the cost. They do charge for social care now if you've got the funds and there is a way around it a lot of people don't know about it and they don't inform people at grassroots that's the issue for disabled people um, the issue is um, if you provide them with enough evidence that you've got additional costs due to your disability then they raise the cost um, but you, ha you have to be told and if you haven't got an advocate they just walk over you <coughs> Um, the other thing I was going to say is mental health is really increased in Newham due to all these cutbacks. And again, when they have mental health crisis, um, the support is put in around the crisis time, but it's not followed through. all. So it's continuous care packages are not being implemented. And that's a real worry because these uh, people sometimes have a double, um, they have the mental health needs as well as physical health needs and social care needs like autism or approaches. And they're just being neglected and left to neglect, you know, and all the people are just left to die individually in their own homes and at risk because of these serious cutbacks. Can I just introduce Mark at the back? Uh, uh, Mark, I don't know if you want to come in and... <laughs> Yeah. Uh. 
Okay. Uh, my name is Mark Williams. I come from Bristol, and I'm Anne's PA, or one of his PAs. Uh, I live independently with 24-hour PA support. This has worked well for 24 years. With this support, mm. I am able to work as a trainer for social workers. I have been working as a school mm. governor for the past 10 years. I am also an active member of the Bristol Disability Equality Forum. I have attended many national campaigns. This takes this takes all of my time, which I thoroughly enjoy, and am able to do successfully with PA support. Every two years for the past 10 years, I've had a review, and my 24-hour package has never changed. However, in July this year, my review started. After two appointments with my social worker, they suggested I needed time on my own in order to build my confidence. <laughs> I was then asked to complete a 24-hour diary over two weeks. This caused me and my PAs quite a lot of stress. Everyone had different ideas how this would be done. It was very hard to know how much detail to put in. In the end, my diary ended up 29 pages of all my daily activities, including very personal details of my life. I felt I had no private life. After a lot of stress and work, I handed my diary personally to my social worker on the 16th of October. From the next day, my social worker has been off sick. <laughs> I have heard nothing since. I know people say good news, no news is good news, but I feel very anxious about what the final decision will be. I think this pro process is very undermining and moving forward. Thank you, Anne. Okay, shall we just spend a, uh, just if there are any final comments about people's experiences? Because I think the whole purpose of today is also just kind of sharing our experiences, but also coming up with some ideas about how we can challenge and keep fighting and campaigning against this crap. Um, so just a. Yeah, um, I, I was at the bereavement first, then uh, a proper assessment with a social worker. Um, and, it, and then I was offered then, when that fell through, I was then offered an assessment with a mental health team. And then they can support me because of my physical health needs. So there isn't kind of a holistic way of working if you've got mental health and physical um, um, uh, challenges. Um, I then I've been recently assessed, and um, I asked the social worker for the, the you know, the, the copy of the form, and she said, "Oh well, it's um, it goes on the system, and it'd be too much for me to print out for you." So, so you know, they don't want to give information, and because you know, I'm quite savvy, and on top of things, they don't want to be challenged, um, mm. because every report that I've had, I've had to challenge it because they fabricate and all the rest of it. Mm. Um, and there was something else, but it's gone. Um, actually, yes, um, OTs, OTs again, um, to get a report, to, to, to get an assessment and a report from them is very difficult. And because they can influence housing, they don't want to influence housing anymore. And because also, with, in particularly in my borough, I live in the borough of Southwark, they've been um, reshifting re and people have left with voluntary redundancies and all the rest of it. So housing and social care used to have one colleague that sits between the two departments. That's now gone. Mm. So there isn't any expertise in terms of accessible housing. Um, so yeah, it's very difficult. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Just from here again, back. Do you want me to? Um, yeah, uh, my name's Carlo. I'm a bit concerned, apart from things like the Daily case, about some judgments that I can't remember any names. I'm sorry, but it was quite recent. Some judgments uh, backed by judges that apparently mean 
that disabled people's needs can be completely ignored. And uh, as a result, um, local it basically strength it strengthens the some local authorities' arms even more to completely ignore um, disabled people's needs. And the other thing is this thing that's beginning to get momentum about um, to do with HMRC. I know, I know it doesn't, it may not apply to everyone in this room, but about um, not uh, rates for sleep colour and what disabled people are being threatened with. We've seen on things like disability news service that um, disabled people in different parts of the country may suddenly be hit not only with huge bills that are historic and it's not their fault because they won't have been given the, the, the right rates to begin with but also the possibility of actually being named and shamed if they can't do so, they can't rectify the situation within a within their specified length of time, HMRC. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, my care package was cut by a teacher by 48%. So I went to Walton Forest Town Hall and I had a demonstration there, um, which was covered by the local press. And I had people there like Andy Green from Deepak. And we sung protest songs mm -hmm. in the Wolf Forest Town Hall. Mm -hmm. And then we also, I also um, contacted the national media and we embarrassed the council, who then wrote mm -hmm. back and said, we're not going to comment about what's happening. Since that time, they have effectively gone away. Mm -hmm. So they didn't implement that, they haven't, they haven't yet implemented that. They're going to try. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my, my situation is, is about, like everyone else, it's a bit convoluted. Um, I had um, a lady come out to do a, a, a pre-assessment of me. <clears throat> because I take so much medication, um, she, she had to go on a second sheet. I then went, and I thought this would be passed on to the um, assessor, which it wasn't. I had to travel to Bristol on a Sunday. Um, I had to park on the on the road outside, uh, which is by the docks. And I got a parking ticket. That's, that, again, is irrelevant. I had my blue badge up. Again, irrelevant. <laughs> but um, I then went to the situation. Um, of, she said to me, don't worry, I'm on your side, blah de blah, mm. which she obviously wasn't, because within two weeks I thought everything was taken away. Mm. However, I wrote back immediately and said, I mean, with all due respect, the woman has made up stories about me, and there, there, was a, there was items at the back which she said I was asked to do various physical activities, which is an absolute lie, because mm. I, never, I never was asked to do it. Anyway, <clears throat> so I wrote back immediately within 24 hours and said, uh, I don't trust this, I don't trust the lady, I don't trust the system. And lo and behold, within a week, I had all the facilities put back in. Mm -hmm. But then I had another letter saying, um, I'm, you know, the, the, sorry, I've got to explain this. The third letter came from DWP, like head office. And those are the people who said everything has been put back in place. Mm -hmm. And then I had another letter from the, um, uh, what do you call them, the assessor, um, the gentleman who looks at the claim and said, no, your, your, your withdrawal stands, whatever. But since then, the last letter I've got has been lost. I mean, all of my, you know, they continue to pay me. And the last woman, if it was a woman, um, who, who said, no, you can't have anything, been a normal. Right. So I'm, I mean, in theory, I shouldn't be having any benefit.
assessment and they're not listening to a word of what the clients are saying, I go with them and then I challenge them and then I win. But it means all that stress for my clients, which I don't agree with. So I've now decided as a group that I'm going to put a complaint in and say, why is this that they're not listening to a word of my service users? Why are they giving them zero, zero points? And I as a group action or a class action and say, we're not having this. Yeah. Because how come all of us are going through those bloody hideous assessments get zero zero points? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that's if we can move on to that. So Sophia's just suggested that we look at working together to do group complaints, whatever the assessment is, whether it's, it's social services mm. assessments or or PIP assessments. Yeah. Yeah. Any other ideas? Yeah, well, I'm going to start up with another services, a mutual support group, um, because I don't meet disabled people in my borough, and I would like to hear stories locally, and then hopefully try and call in support and try and fight back the council. And, and again, it's, it's another um, personal sacrifice, if you like, because it's energy that sometimes we don't have, but it's a necessary because they're not supporting us. Yeah. Um, so kind of like a collective, locally support. Yeah. That was a big thing that came out of the Disabled People's Summit a couple of weeks ago, was exactly that. We've got huge amounts of expertise about going through these assessments that we can share with each but, other. But we, can I just say something? We'll do things quickly. We, we did this about 20 years ago. Why have we got to go all through it again? Yeah. Well, that's true. Because they're not the same. <laughs> We're going backwards. We're not going forward. So we've got to start all over again. And we're all 20 years old. And can I say something very, very quickly? I won't be long. I, because my care package broke down completely, before I had my right money um, reinstated, I, w I w asked the social services to help me because I was in crisis. And I was put in a home um, initially for three days, but I only stayed there one night because they dropped me on the floor oh. three times <laughs> within an hour. Mm. So, you know, that's all I'm going to say about that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah um, just kind of think about why are some of the issues happening and what the solutions will be. And I think some of the things we need to think about is that we've weakened the voices of disabled people in terms of disabled people's organisations, the way they're funded, they're not allowed to do certain things, um, yeah. work's been taken off for disabled people in terms of advocacy. Yeah. Um, when you look at the way direct payments is operated, you're not allowed to respect the rights around it. We're more of an implementation service rather than supporting people to know what their rights are. So people are not quite clear um, of what you said, what a review is and what an assessment is. And it's, it's, a, it's a lottery if you meet somebody who's able to talk you through the system. So it's about how do we now get that collective voice together to actually share the knowledge? Because we have a lot of knowledge, but we haven't got the knowledge in central spot. Yeah. Um, so we've got lots of DPOs, but then maybe the in, how you're allowed to work, if yeah, you get yeah. caught advocating, yeah. you could lose that contract. We haven't got the power. And you're, you're the power for you to actually tell somebody else what their rights are, it's become like a prisonable offence. Mm. There's a risk. Mm. So what we're seeing now is a lot more disabled people not knowing what they're able to access. So I think the question is, how do we actually now get to empower disabled people about their rights? Yeah. And how do we bring those voices together? There's no point just saying we bring people in the room to rant. It's about how do we upskill disabled people yeah. without having to depend on local authorities for the funding. Because if you're getting money from local authority, they will dictate um, what your knowledge yeah. can be. That's a great point and maybe yeah. one of the actions we can do is do some real lobbying of the Equality of Human Rights Commission to fund DDPOs yeah. to do that yeah. advice 
sharing mm. so all yeah. of us are better informed about our rights mm -hmm. and so that we're able then to do yeah. workshops with mm. each other and, and, and share rights if mm. we're going to set yeah. up a peer support group. Can I, can I just add to that, Trace? Um, so if you've got somebody who doesn't know what their rights are and they're having to communicate with other professionals, they're not going to be able to uh, work their way through the system at yeah. all. So therefore the system becomes your voice. And therefore, you're automatically disempowered because you don't know what review is, you don't know what an assessment is, you don't know what you're entitled to. Yeah. So you're at the start. There's no point even going to that assessment. You might as well do a virtual assessment because they've already made their mind up before you've gone into that room. and you're a parent of a disabled child, adult, or whatever, oh, yeah. it's a double whammy. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, the barriers that you hit there, and if you don't know you're right, they do walk over you, and then they are sometimes play you against your own family. Mm -hmm. And they're very manipulative in how they do it um, to get away with it. But it, it is like you said, because um, my own personal experience is it abused my son's human rights. Yeah. And I'm trying to push yeah. that because I'm, I'm just thinking of the many other parents that haven't got a voice. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Tracy, can I say that you're not asking the right people. You're not asking us the people. Yeah. We should be. Yeah. Like, we're tra being treated like prisoners in life. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I don't like yeah. it. Can I just mention something? I mean, it, it also takes into account what Sarifa had said about when you get the assessment and it's zero, 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 yeah. how on earth can it be zero if obviously they were giving you um, support before? Mm -hmm. yeah. And then, you know, um, I've had an experience where um, it depends on who the assessor is on the day, mm -hmm. and they're usually from Atos, right? Mm -hmm. And the assessor, if they've come from a far distance, right, and they've yeah. had to come on a weekend, <laughs> and it's perhaps early in the morning, can get really upset, because that's what happened in my case. And um, I actually heard them make a comment, like, who comes out on a weekend and was really getting angry and irate? Mm. Not saying anything to me, but saying to somebody who was one of the receptionists. And I, I, was, I remember saying, oh, I pity the person who's um, got that person oh. as an assessor, not, not knowing that it was going to be me. <laughs> And then when I did get into the room, my son was with me because he's supporting me. And um, he toned himself down and he made sure that he said as little as possible. And even though I was giving my story, my end, it meant nothing to him. You'll hear from us. In, you'll hear from, it's, he made it quite clear that it's not down to him, but he's the one who's doing the assessment, making the notes, and they're making their judgment based on what he's written. And it was it came up zero zero zero, in the, and they immediately stopped my benefits. What then happened? I had to go through um, what do you call it? An appeal. And when when we did go for the appeal, they reinstated everything that I should have had, even backdated it from um, I don't know if it was a year, two years, or whatever it was. So you know, and this and and 
who was actually in the room assessing me mm. at the time mm. was a doctor yeah. and um, I, I can't remember who else, yeah, or some professionals. Yeah. Now, the person yeah. who initially did the assessment was, um, what do you call it, is it a physiotherapist? Yes. So they get all these different people, nurses and what have you, to do an assessment. Yeah. Now, how qualified are they really yeah. to stand in judgment of us and our illnesses? Exactly. So we live with our illnesses. So I yeah. you want to um, it was actually following on from Michelle's point. Everyone in this room, by virtue of getting into this room and to be able to be here to have this conversation, you know what your rights are yeah. and yeah. you're empowered. Mm -hmm. There are so many disabled people that don't know what their rights are to not even know that they could be in this room. Yeah. Yeah. I think we yeah. need some kind of way of reaching mm -hmm. people that are incredibly marginalised and isolated. And I think that means, to some degree, empowered disabled people taking action to go to places where we wouldn't normally be seen dead. So the places like institutions yeah. to show other disabled people that they do have a choice and that they don't have to be where they are. But unless we start doing that, no one else is going to tell um, those disabled people that they have options. Okay. Uh, so I just, uh, I just wondered, this, um, everyone's uh, talking about the uh, local government. Uh, May 2018 is the local elections. Uh, are any of you in contact with your local councillors, or uh, at all? It's like you know, just making it as hard for them as possible if they're not actually uh, assisting you. Yeah, we're going to be talking this afternoon about kind of campaigning as well explicitly. But well, well, I listen. That's a question. Campaigning against them. I just want to say that um, maybe it's just a thought. I'm a single woman for 30 years, right? I don't have any children. I don't have any family support because they're too happy in their own worlds outside of London, very far. So I basically am on the mercy of one or two friends when they have got time or what time they've got. Now, going for these assessments, obviously I was advised a long time ago, I'm from Islington Borough, that take someone with you. Now, my biggest stress is, like I just had an assessment uh, in August, was which of my two friends are going to be available to go with me. I was just very lucky that that friend happened to be available and he's kind-hearted. He's a family man with children. And he said, right, I, I will go. So my stress always is who, you know, availability of someone going with me who can witness what I said, what they said, rather than, you know, me. So I don't know. I'm not saying that, you know, I'm looking for, the, for a team of people that should help me, but I'm sure there must be other people who are in my situation. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, there's one stage about knowing your rights, yeah. but then it's about the advocacy and support to make use of them. I mean, one, if we're, today we're talking about kind of the models of support that we want to lobby the political parties on. Do you think there is a... Do you think we should be demanding that... It's a statutory requirement to fund deaf and disabled people's organisation yeah. and yeah. independent yeah. advice yeah. and advocacy yeah. 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 so that, you know, DPOs are not silenced <laughs> and they actually have a duty to fund uh, our organisations to do the very support that you've been talking about so we're not relying on necessarily... Can I just say that people that I feel sorry for is the people that have English as a second language as well as disability because yeah. yeah. that's another barrier. And same with the mental health, because if they've got social phobias, anxiety issue, who's representing their voices? Yeah, I'm very, I'm very articulate. But what about the people that aren't? Yeah, absolutely. So advice and advocacy is key, and we want that independent. We want it valued, our independent advocacy respected, and it becomes a statutory requirement to fund it. Yeah. Can yeah. I just I just want to bring in a couple of people I haven't spoken. Angela, do you want to come in?
independent living mention access and inclusion and participation in things because it cuts them off by then introducing that that kind of that um, bastardized idea of independent better. living. Yeah. 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 Sorry, we're going a bit over time. Okay, all right. Just a final comments and then yeah. I'll just try and, and very briefly sum up some key things that have come out. So really quick interventions. Yes, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um I would agree about the advocacy because places like mine and together it's left down to each um local organisation to have the kind of um, decision to have an advocate. Most minds don't have an advocacy. And with the agenda for mental health people to get back to work, you know, there's an agenda there clearly. Perhaps a, a, a national fact sheet, so what people's rights are. I don't know if that's something that Inclusion London could help facilitate. Um, access to experts and solicitors, uh, maybe a list of those kind of professionals, so kind of local groups um, can get access to that. And also perhaps a discussion around how we can remove the barriers to meet it because if you're just starting up, you don't have access to rent a room or something. I don't know if um, organisations can help support, you know, grassroots, um, you know, activism. Fantastic, some really brilliant practical things there. I'm, I, just any final comments? Why is there no disabled social workers or something like that? Sorry, Michael, say that again. Yeah. I know disabled social workers in life. Well, yeah. That's a really good question. They are. They are. They're dyslexic ones, no doubt. What do you mean the ones that are going to listen to us, though? That's what I mean. Well, just say it's something in terms of peer support. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
offer peer support to each other, whether that's practically about meeting space or online. There's lots we can do now, unlike 20 years ago, about supporting each other without physically having to go somewhere. That's what we did. We made the foundation. Yeah. But we've got one more I can gather from my recent experience and from this um, conference today. I think we've got to start all over again. Well, <laughs> keep, keep, or keep going, really. Yeah. And there, there's something about, in terms of what we want and our demands about in statutory duty to fund independent yeah. advocacy and advice and being really clear about our definition of independent yeah. living. Yeah. Does that sound yeah. about yeah. right as yeah. a summary yeah. of what we're... OK, sorry, Michael, we've got to finish because I think uh, Brian will come, come over and tell me off. So thank you. I think we've now got lunch out there. So thank you. Um, see you later. Okay, thank you for joining us. Um, well, breaking for lunch. Should be back by, um, I think, 2.30? Is it 2, 2.30? Back at half two, having lunch now. <laughs>